right. Well, it's six o'clock, and so I promise to get started promptly, and we're going to uh, get started with a great evening of talking uh, Lake Huron Fisheries. So good evening and welcome to our annual spring uh, 2021 Lake Huron Fisheries Workshop Series. Uh, tonight, we take a focus to the, our nearshore fisheries. Uh, we'll be covering some great uh, fisheries of Lake Huron along our coastline from the Lachino Island area fisheries to the St. Mary's River to the Saginaw Bay uh, perch and walleye fisheries that we all uh, love and enjoy. We'll be talking some Cisco restoration opportunities in Lake Huron as well as some cormorant management updates and end our evening with uh, some conversations with our, our DNR fisheries managers uh, covering Lake Huron. Uh, so this is a part of an educational series we, uh, Michigan Sea Grant and Michigan State University Extension host with our partners each spring. Uh, so this is the second of, of a couple of workshops. Last week we had a session focused on the open water fisheries. Uh, and so if you want to check that out, we'll drop a link to the recording for that session in the chat of interest. Uh, you might want to check out the Lake Huron Michigan Predator Diet Study as an opportunity for you as anglers to contribute to contribute as community scientists uh, to that uh, important study. And if after tonight you haven't had enough talk about our Lake Huron fisheries, we're going to collaborate with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources in their DNR conversation and coffee next Thursday, May 6th from 6 to 7. And I'd encourage you all to join. It's a great opportunity to continue this conversation. So again, tonight, uh, our focus is on the nearshore fisheries. And um, I always like to start these workshops with uh, 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 thanks and appreciation to all the partners that collaborate in pulling these uh, Lake Huron Fisheries workshops together. It's truly a, a team effort. We have a great wealth of uh, wisdom from our research and management agencies and universities contributing, uh, including the Michigan Department of Natural Resources Fisheries, uh, the USGS Great Lakes Science Center, who contributed to last week's talks, the US Fish and Wildlife Wildlife Service, USDA Wildlife Services, uh, the Eagle Office of the Great Lakes, and the Saginaw Bay Reef Partnership, among uh, many others. And uh, we couldn't do this workshop, do these workshops without our community, important community partners and, and fishing organizations who have supported these workshops over the years, help us to think about what to bring out uh, to the communities in these workshops, and certainly help to support by promoting and getting folks uh, to attend these workshops. And I need to draw attention to the Michigan Department and Natural Resources uh, Lake Huron uh, Citizen Fishery Advisory Committee. On the, the, the webinar this evening with us is Frank Christ uh, from the Hammond Bay Area Anglers, who is the chair of this committee. Uh, and he's joining us tonight because uh, th that committee, uh, those advisors are also Michigan Sea Grant advisors. They work with, with us throughout the year to really think about how do we make the best use of these workshops and bring the great information they talk about all year long out, out to you through these webinars, which are normally hosted in person, but given the times we're, we're hosting this workshop uh, virtually. Um, so this, this committee, uh, the conversation tonight, uh, your questions, your input are being gathered by Frank and myself, and we're excited to share uh, this conversation tonight with, with that advisory committee. Um, and then finally, I want to I want to appreciate my own Sea Grant uh, Michigan Sea Grant team. So I, I'm Brandon Schroeder. I serve as an extension educator out of Northeast Michigan and Northern Lake Huron, uh, and I'm happy to um, I'm proud to be a facilitator tonight and hoping to keep us on task and, and out on time. We have an action packed agenda, uh, but I also want to in introduce my other Lake Huron Extension colleagues: uh, Megan Goss from the Saginaw Bay Region, Elliot Nelson from the Eastern Upper Peninsula, who are helping to facilitate tonight uh, in the background as well as Mary uh, Bowling, uh, who's an extension educator in, in Southeast Michigan, covering some of the Southern Lake Huron uh, communities. And of course, our fantastic communication team, including Cindy Hudson in the background, helping to make sure uh, hopefully this all goes seamlessly tonight. So um, a little bit about Michigan Sea Grant. Um, our role is, is we're a non-regulatory agency. Our role is really to promote Great Lakes uh, science and research and think about how to bring uh, that science and research out in useful ways to our coastal communities through education and outreach. We're a, a federal program of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but in Michigan, we're a partnership between uh, Michigan State University and the University of Michigan. And so a lot of the educational programs we do 
will look like this, really thinking about how do we uh, benefit from the research and science uh, around Lake Huron fisheries and how do we make use of that as, as anglers and charter boat captains and communities invested in, in valuing our Great Lakes fisheries. We also, aside from educational workshops like this, provide a, a wealth of educational materials. Uh, check out our website. Uh, we just re-released a fourth edition of the Life of the Lakes, a guide to the Great Lakes fishery. If you're interested in uh, the Salmonid family, there's a, a neat um, identification uh, guide that you might be interested in checking out, um, all available on our website, and we're, we'll be posting some of those links in the chat as well. Um, so as an educational program, and because we receive federal funding, I wanted to share this, this, um, this anti-discrimination acknowledgement. Uh, and we are really required, but we also make a commitment to ensure that all of our programs and resources are, are available and accessible to anyone and everyone uh, who, who might be interested or value or benefit from those resources uh, without discrimination. So um, appreciate all of your all of our partners and your help uh, to make sure that our, our resources are, are shared as widely as folks uh, would like to, to enjoy them. So with that, um, I appreciate everybody taking the evening to talk Lake Huron Fisheries. And without uh, further ado, I'm gonna jump us into our program. Uh, we have some amazing uh, nearshore fisheries in Lake Huron. So we did a, a three-sided twink coin toss to see where we should start tonight. Um, and where we, uh, the winner of that coin toss was the Lachino Island area. And so I am gonna introduce uh, Dave Fielder, who's a, a researcher with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, who will be providing um, that update for us this evening. This is an update on the status of the yellow perch population and fishery in the Lachino Islands, with a lot of special reference to its status relative to what's going on with cormorants um, in the islands. And we'll also talk about some other species as well. Most people are familiar with where the Lational Islands are. And it's an archipelago along the um, north shore of Lake Huron, part of the Upper Peninsula, about 26 some islands. The channels and embayments form some very pristine cool water habitat. Uh, the centerpiece of the recreational fishery there for many years has been yellow perch. Some of the smaller uninhabited islands have also become uh, important uh, nesting sites for uh, double crested cormorants <clears throat> that migrate to the, uh, the Great Lakes for nesting each year. And of course, cormorants are a piscivorous bird and we've long been tracking that complicated relationship between their predation and the effects on yellow perch and the fishery. Our information tonight comes from a, a variety of sources. We have an annual fish community assessment netting survey uh, that we perform uh, with three key index stations uh, in <coughs> the Lational Islands. We've been doing that every year since 1969, the first week of October. We even use the same kind of gear. So if we see changes in the catch that indicates a change in the, the fish community. Then we have the creel survey, which has been done periodically and then every year since the year 2000. Uh, that's where uh, anglers are interviewed at the end of a fishing trip. We learn about what they were fishing for, what they caught and harvested, how long they fished for, and it also includes an aerial flight that uh, counts the number of boats. And all this comes together to make estimates of, of harvest, and angler catch rate, and then the amount of fishing effort. Lastly is the, the cormorant monitoring, which is mainly in the form of nest counts that has been uh, performed by uh, different organizations over the years, but over about the last uh, <clears throat> uh, 15 or 18 years, it's been performed by our partners at uh, USDA APHIS Wildlife Services. This has been the trend in cormorant nest numbers uh, in the Lational Islands since uh, the, about 1980. We can see at their peak around uh, 2002, 2003, they were at about 5,500 nests. So this means at least 11,000 mature breeding birds, probably some more um, Immature birds were also uh, part of that count. 
And then you can see where management was begun really in 2004 in the forms of um, calling and uh, nest egg oiling to bring their numbers down. And it worked. It brought their numbers down, uh, and we were tracking and monitoring what the response is in the fish community. And then there was a lawsuit against the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It resulted in a suspension of management there in 2016. Numbers of uh, nesting cormorants started to come back up again. Uh, we were able to secure permission to do some partial management at a reduced level. Uh, and that leveled off their numbers, but at something about a higher level in 2020. Now, this is the same curve I just showed you here for cormorants. So to help you visualize the, the um, where we are in terms of trends with other indices. And in this case, this is krill survey information with the uh, uh, angler harvest on this axis here in the blue line and then the angler catch rate on the red line for this axis over here. Now the catch rate again is the number of yellow perch per hour being harvested. So you can think of it as sort of a, an expression of quality of fishing. Uh, the And then of course harvest is simply the numbers being um, harvested. And you can see where we are today relative to the the much higher levels back in the uh, 1980s and early 90s. Uh, the, the fishery really bottomed out during this period of, which was the, the period of peak cormorant abundance. This blue area arrow indicates when uh, cormorant management began, and we can see the recovery, at least of the catch rate, and some improvement in harvest. When you have a higher catch rate and lower harvest, that tells us that overall effort is low. But what's important is what's gone on recently as cormorant numbers have come back up, uh, harvest has stayed low, uh, and the angler catch rate has bounced around some, but uh, most recently it's back down again. This is the average <coughs> yellow perch uh, catch per unit effort in our survey nets. This is that long-term time series that goes back to 1969 that I mentioned. And we can see how their numbers were lower during the cormorant years. As their numbers came down the cormorants, we saw some improvement in abundance. More recently, we saw that decline. We saw a little bit of recovery. But what's important and troubling is our most recent value dropped way down. And so we are concerned that we are seeing a, um, a response in uh, yellow perch abundance relative to this ongoing sustained higher abundance of cormorants. If we look at just our Hessel station, this is the longest uh, time series for the most consistently surveyed uh, station. We see that the number there is bottom out to almost zero. Uh, very troubling. We haven't seen that for quite a while. This is the uh, average age of yellow perch. And that's a convenient indicator because when mortality rates are high, <clears throat> um, basically all that's left are the very youngest perch coming into the system. And we see that reflected here. And we predicted that as cormorant numbers came down, their, um, the, the average age would rebuild up to a higher level, and it did. Now what we see uh, over the last two years, it has come way back down again, consistent with the idea that they are enduring uh, a lot of mortality. This is the uh, average length at age three, uh, both males and females combined, um, using this as an uh, indicator of abundance. So uh, when they are at the right capacity for the available habitat and prey base, you'll see that their average rate is hung, uh, hung right around the state average. As uh, their numbers, as perch numbers went down, as cormorant numbers went up, the perch growth rate went way up. So the few perch that were surviving were growing very fast. We predicted that as cormorant numbers came down and mortality dropped, that their growth rate would also decline, reflecting an increase in abundance. And that's what it's done most recently. Now here in this case, most recently, it's come back down. So we're getting some mixed 
messages and some of this data, but you can see that it's been bouncing around some. These error bars up and down are simply the, the confidence intervals around the, the average uh, value for the length at age for the yellow perch. This is the total annual mortality rate. <clears throat> Um, you, can be, you can think of this as the percentage of perch that are, are dying every year as a result of both harvest, but also natural mortality sources, and that would certainly include predation by a predator like cormorants. And we can see how generally it was higher in the presence of, of cormorants. This lower period here was actually an artifact of the estimation method. This is done with catch curves, and so it requires a uh, an age distribution that reflects the uh, mortality rate, but if mortality rates are great enough across all ages, it will flatten that curve. I think that's what was going on here. But we can see that mortality rates have been as high as 90% uh, in the presence of abundant cormorants. And we predicted that that would come down as cormorant numbers came down, and it did. More recently, it's been climbing back up now. Lately, most lately, it's uh, low again. But again, that could be the flattening of that catch curve as a result of higher uh, predation rates. Now, an alternative explanation to cormorant effects is simply that there's less reproduction or recruitment of yellow perch. So we want to track that. And we do that by looking at the average catch per unit effort in our survey nets of age two yellow perch. And that's what these, these blue bars are here, again, the confidence intervals for the error bars. When we look at the most recent level of 2020, we can see that there's a year class in there that's consistent with other year classes. So perch are reproducing. We are getting recruitment. So these, these other fluctuations we think we see in abundance probably are reflecting mortality. Let's look now at northern pike. Uh, pike have been important in the uh, Lational Islands for a long time. Especially recently, uh, their numbers have really increased as um, cormorant numbers came down. This has become an important feature of the recreational fishery in uh, the Lational Islands. Most recently now, their numbers are also coming back down, uh, consistent with the idea that there may be uh, increased ongoing predation effects from cormorants. This could also reflect uh, some declining water levels. But given that we're looking here at 2020, 2019, I think this is still kind of a high water era such that I think uh, that we can't hang that just on water level change. Brown bullheads are abundant in the Lational Islands, and so they serve as yet one more species to look at. We can see how they are at very low abundance when cormorants were at their peak. They increased in abundance as cormorants came down um, more recently, they've come down, they went up, but now they're back down again. So we see some fluctuation there um, that suggests that at least most recently they're at a lower level. This is the same kind of information, just a different style of graphic, but this is for smallmouth bass. We had an enormous catch rate back in 2018, but more recently, 2020, they're back down here. Still a relatively high abundance, but it's been trending lower. So here are some conclusions. Generally, the yellow perch and other notable species are trending in key indicators consistent with excessive predation losses to a predator consistent with past cormorant effects. Yellow perch abundance is now to a degraded state reflecting a, a collapse. Cormorants, we estimate, are consuming 2 million yellow perch per year in 2020, while anglers are taking just about 31,000. So perch are being over allocated between the two different uh, demands, birds and human uses. Northern pike are compromised and have lost ground from their high abundance in recent years. Brown bullheads are uh, compromised and have lost ground as well. Smallmouth bass appear to be holding their own and remain in good quantity, but they are also on a trajectory towards lower abundance. So. Um, well, we don't nearly have the number of cormorants that we did at one time. They are at a level that suggests that they're still having a substantial effect on these key fish species in the fish community. And a number of people uh, contribute to this annual work and uh, support our efforts, and so we're uh, grateful to their contributions to 
be able to have these surveys every year. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks, Dave. I'm going to move us along. There's some additional questions c coming in that we can respond to in type or get back to at the end of the meeting. Uh, for now, I'm going to give you a virtual round of applause and uh, move us on uh, to our, we're going to move north uh, to the St. Mary's uh, River. And so Neil Godby, also with uh, the Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Division, uh, works with the St. Mary's uh, River Fisheries Task Group with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and is uh, agreed to provide a, a really neat update for us this evening. So thank you, Neil. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to present the St. Mary's River Fisheries Task Group update today. There's a lot going on in the St. Mary's River, and this will be a brief overview of some of the issues in the area, as well as ongoing and planned projects by the task group and its member agencies. The St. Mary's River Fisheries Task Group is part of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission structure and is organized under the Lake Huron Technical Committee. In recognition of the many agencies of jurisdiction over the river or parts thereof, the group is composed of representatives from U.S. and Canadian federal agencies, state and provincial agencies, and tribal and First Nation resource agencies. Additionally, Universities and colleges in the area serve as resource members in the group. We are excited about an ongoing lake sturgeon study in the river, which was initiated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service 2019 with assistance from other project partners with a set line survey to study the lake sturgeon population of the river. We are planning to expand on the Lake Sturgeon study starting in 2021, looking at critical habitats and population characteristics through tagging and acoustic telemetry. The project objectives include habitat use by life stage, including adults and subadults, river population abundance, survival by life stage, and composition of the St. Mary's River stock. This project is a collaborative study with agencies providing substantial in-kind contributions, including hydrophone receivers. We are still seeking funding, however, for project implementation in 2022 and beyond. Here's a map of the proposed placement of the hydrophone array for the St. Mary's River Lake Sturgeon study. There are 54 hydrophone locations proposed throughout the river with hydrophones provided by task group member agencies. We are coordinating this through GLaDOS as well. The Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry will also be deploying an array of acoustic receivers in the North Channel and Lake Huron that will extend the coverage of the array planned for the St. Mary's River Sturgeon study. An emerging issue of concern in the St. Mary's River is Didymo, or rock snot. Didymo is a stock diatom that can bloom to nuisance levels. It is brown to white in color, feels like wet wool, and looks like used toilet paper. It was first reported in the main St. Mary's River Rapids in June 2015, which was also the first location it was found in Michigan waters. The picture on the left shows a Didymo bloom in the rapids, while on the right is a picture of Didymo found in a lamprey trap by Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Didymo is considered to be widespread, but is rare in northern colder oligotrophic waters. Here are a few more pictures showing Didymo in the river and its extensive extracellular stock production. These stocks can create two to three foot long mats. On the left is a picture of Didymo blooming around a drift net. On the right is an LSSU student holding some near the Little Rapids Bridge and there's a tub of it uh, at the top. There is a need for Didymo research in the St. Mary's River, including surveillance monitoring of the river, tributaries, and Lake Superior shoreline, a better understanding of environmental triggers of blooms, such as dissolved nutrients, nutrient limitation, flow, etc., 
a need to evaluate the ecological impacts of Diddy Moe in the river. A pilot study on the effects on fish spawning and egg survival will start in 2021. Other needs include studying the changes to benthos and nearshore hypoxia issues related to the floating mats. LSSU recently received funding to address some of the research needs and is also working with the Sioux Tribe, Bay Mills Indian Community, and the United States Army Corps of Engineers uh, on a potential project as well. Another area of interest in the St. Mary's River is the Little Rapids. For those unfamiliar with the area, this is one of four historic rapids areas in the St. Mary's River. This area is a causeway which previously blocked most of the flow with only two six-foot culverts. A bridge, approximately 625 foot long, was installed in the fall of 2016 to restore flow to the historic rapids area as part of the Little Rapids restoration project. This project addressed a beneficial use impairment in the St. Mary's River area of concern. As I said previously, this project was completed in November 2016 with short-term monitoring of effects occurring through 2018. The short-term monitoring found an increase in sensitive macroinvertebrate taxa, an increase in cool water lithophilic fish species, an increase in game fish, and an increase in recreational fishing use, which was high. Longer-term monitoring of the ecological response to the restoration project is proposed. And we are currently seeking funding to accomplish that monitoring. Another project of interest is being done by USGS, LSSU, the Army Corps of Engineers, as part of an evaluation of recent improvements in operations of the compensating gates. The objectives of the project are to study the larval fish drift and production coming from the St. Mary's River Rapids, see how that larval production relates to river discharge and velocity changes at various gate settings. Field collections so far in the study have found that lake sturgeon spawning and larval drift are occurring in the rapids area, and that larval drift is dominated by rainbow smelt. There is evidence of corgonid spawning and transport. A full field season is planned for 2021. Modeling of hydrology and larval drift is in process. Another part of the study is measuring the extent of exposed riverbed and stranding of fishes after the winter gate closure. The rapids area was surveyed in 2019 and 2020 immediately after the gate closure. Some stranding of forage fish and salmonid eggs and fry were found. The impact is likely dependent, however, on the month or week of closure to avoid active spawning. A proposal for continued study is being developed. Sea lamprey control is continuing in the St. Mary's River. Approximately 312 hectares of high density larval habitat are scheduled for baleside treatment in 2021. The Root River and possibly the Whitefish Channel will be treated in 2021 pending approval from the Batchewana First Nation. Another survey effort by task group members includes aquatic invasive species, early detection and monitoring. This survey targets juvenile and adult fish new to the Great Lakes. It is an annual survey initiated in 2013 by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Partners include the Ontario Ministry, Natural Resources and Forestry, and the Sioux Tribe. The good news is that no new invasive species were detected in 2020. A lot of fish, over 5,000, were examined, representing 46 taxa at 69 sites. All sites were sampled by Sioux Tribe in 2020. The map shows locations of round goby and rough collected in 2020 as part of the survey effort. 
The red dots show the round Gobi locations, while the yellow stars show locations where rough were found. A topic of great interest to many is the construction of a new lock in Sault Ste. Marie by the Army Corps of Engineers to accommodate 1,000-foot ore freighters. Here's a brief update on the status of that project. Dredging of the upstream approach is scheduled to end in 2021, while the construction of the approach walls will start this year. Planning and permitting for Phase 3 is underway, and fisheries concerns are being addressed as part of that process. Major parts of Phase 3 include blasting and dredging in the dry for the new lock and a bridge and parking deck to the North Power Plant. Based on fisheries comments, the bridge will be clear span with construction starting in the fall of 2021 or spring of 2022. Here's an overhead view of the Sioux locks and surrounding area. Here are the upstream approach and approach walls that I discussed previously. And here's the North Power Plant with the bridge, with the proposed location of the bridge here, going here. And here's the pedestrian bridge, which will be removed. Finally, I'd like to highlight a pair of surveys planned by the task group for 2022, namely the Fish Community Survey and the Whole River Creel Survey. First, the Fish Community Survey. This is a long-term survey series with the 2022 effort being the 10th in the series that started in 1975. A total of 45 stations or locations will be sampled with all task group member agencies participating. The survey was last done in 2017 and is planned to be conducted every five years in conjunction with the CSMI Year of Intensive Monitoring for Lake Huron. Here's an example of some of the data we gathered during our fish community survey in 2017 using Northern Pike as an example. As you can see, we track catch per unit effort over time as an indicator of abundance. Northern pike are showing an increasing trend in abundance, likely due to the higher water levels in recent years, providing increased habitat. Age and length distributions are also presented, along with percent maturity by length group. The Whole River Creel Survey is the other survey scheduled for 2022 and is also planned for every five years to accompany the Fish Community Survey and the CSMI Year of Intensive Monitoring for Lake Huron. 2022 will be just the third Creel Survey to cover the whole river downstream of the compensating works. Previous surveys have shown that the river receives a substantial amount of fishing effort about 35% or more compared to all the fishing effort in Michigan waters of Lake Huron. This is an expensive survey as it requires flights for fishing pressure counts and a minimum of four creel clerks, two on the Michigan side, two on the Ontario side. Twenty-four fish species were recorded in the catch from the St. Mary's River in 2017. Here's information for walleye as an example. Although harvest and harvest rate for walleye are down from the previous estimate, that previous estimate was done a decade earlier and was calculated through extrapolation. Current estimates are within the historical range. We are still seeking funding for this survey and are excited about accomplishing both the Fish Community Survey and Creel Survey in 2022. Again, Thank you for the opportunity to provide this update. And with that, I will entertain any questions. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Neil. Much appreciate the time you, you. Uh, put into, into compiling that uh, overview and sharing with us this evening. So a uh, virtual <laughs> round of applause for everyone tonight. And I will uh, say goodbye to you and reintroduce uh, Dave Fielder uh, to move us uh, down into the Saginaw Bay region to talk uh, walleye and, and yellow perch. So Dave, welcome back. Hi, I'm Dave Fielder, and I'm pleased to be able to give you an update about Saginaw Bay walleye and yellow perch this evening. 
we have a number of different sources of information that we can draw upon to understand what the, the most current status is of walleye and perch in the bay. We have our annual fish community uh, netting survey that is a combination of gill netting and trawling that dates as far back as the uh, early 1970s. It's been done each year in the same with the same sort of gear uh, at the same time in the in early September. And we can use the changes in the catch to help understand the, the changes in the, the fish populations. We also have our uh, walleye jaw tagging uh, annual operation that dates back to the early 1980s. That gives us information on uh, mortality rates, exploitation rates, and something about movement. Then there's the creel survey, of course, where we interview anglers at the end of their fishing trip to find out uh, what they caught, how long they fished, and that includes an aerial flight that will count boats. And all that information goes together to allow us to make estimates of how many uh, of each species is harvested and what the catch rate is and the amount of fishing effort as well, all important statistics. There's also reporting from the commercial fishery, uh, and that's especially relevant for uh, yellow perch. And then we have a number of computer models that allows us to put this all together and, and make estimates of how many walleye we have. And it's really uh, this information collectively that allows us to know what's going on with uh, walleye mill perch. This is the uh, trawling catch rate of age zero walleye. Now age zero are like the young of year. It's walleye that uh, hatched that spring or back when we were stocking that may have survived from stocking uh, this is uh, about probably a four inch fish maybe depending on the year uh, in, caught in the trawls and on the y-axis on the left so this is the average number per 10 minutes of towing uh, you can see uh, a big change in uh, the amount of reproductive success uh, beginning about 2003 and we attribute that to the decline of alewives in Lake Huron um, alewives began to become scarce and then finally disappeared about that time. Uh, and it was really their absence that allowed walleye to reproduce so well. Uh, the percentage number on top of each bar is the hatchery fish contribution from when we were stocking. And you can see that uh, that number became very low starting in 2003, meaning that almost all these are wild fish since then. We discontinued stocking in 2006, so that's why it's zeros ever since. The 2020 value there <clears throat> is the most recent, newest value. We can see that it's much lower. This is really our first look at your class strength, if you will, and that suggests that it's less in 2020. But we've been forecasting that for some time because the walleye population has been a, um, an all-time high, uh, at least for modern years. and the nature of reproductive success for walleye and yellow perch as well, potentially, is that at high numbers, uh, they actually are going to have less recruitment. It's sort of a compensating mechanism that's built into a lot of fish populations. So we're not surprised that we had some lesser recruitment here in 2020. Now, this is year class strength. Um, at age two, as estimated by one of our computer models, our statistical catch at age model. So this is an actual estimate of how many two-year-olds are out there uh, by year class. And we can see that we've had a number of strong year classes over the last three years, but it is coming down uh, consistent with what we've been expecting. But on the whole, these have been driving higher numbers of walleye in Saginaw Bay. One way we can gauge the abundance of walleye in the bay and where we're at relative to the available prey base and the, the habitat, kind of collectively, the carrying capacity of the bay, if you will, is to look at the growth rate of walleye. And in this case, we're using age three as a convenient indicator, and we have both females and males combined for the sake of this graphic. And you can see back before about 2005 or six, that the uh, the mean length uh, in millimeters was much higher than the state average or what our target level had been. 
And that's consistent with meaning that there was very few walleyes relative to the available prey base and habitat. So they simply grew fast. We predicted that as their numbers came up, their growth rate would go down. And we established a recovery zone. Uh, and we said that once we had three out of five years in that zone, we've reached our recovery targets. And that happened for the first time there in 2009. Now, since then, it's been creeping back up some, but it's staying right within that zone. So we're still within our range of, of recovery. And um, to be clear, it's not that we were actually wanting slower growing walleye, just that we're using this to let the walleye tell us where they are at relative to the capacity of the habitat and the prey base, which means that it's being fully utilized, and that is what we want to have happen. This is trawling again, and this is one of our index, our indices of, of um, abundance for prey fish. Uh, and this is not numbers of fish, but actually biomass in terms of kilograms per 10 minute toe in the trawling. And you can see for a long time how that's been coming down uh, as walleye abundance has been building. And we we're concerned at some points that it was getting so low. What we've been wanting to see is that this would turn the corner and come back up, and we see that happening here in 2020. Um, so this is consistent with the idea that maybe walleye densities are coming down some, although uh, this big increase in 2020 is really just driven by uh, a lot of uh, age zero white perch. But nevertheless, that constitutes some forage. These are the species down here that make up this particular index. Um, this is the walleye harvest in the recreational fishery dating all the way back to 1986. The blue portion of the bar is the open water harvest, and then the red is the winter harvest, mainly the ice fishery, and the green part there is the harvest by uh, the charter boat uh, industry. Uh, we don't have all the information yet for the winter fishery uh, in 2021. This is based on fishing years. So the 2020 would actually be through the March of this year. And so I had to extrapolate that value. So that's a little bit of an estimate there. And we'll update that when we actually get the creel survey reporting. But on the whole, it appears that the, the uh, amount of walleye harvest has come down in 2020 from some otherwise very high numbers. So this is consistent with the idea that the walleye population is in fact getting somewhat smaller. Now this is also some krill survey information. This is the harvest rate. So on the y-axis here, this is the number of walleye per hour being reported harvested uh, by anglers. And it's broken out again by the open water fishery, that's the, the, the blue bar, and then uh, the uh, red bar is the winter fishery, and then the total combined catch unit effort is this green value. And we saw that come back down. So this is really a measure, if you will, of, of how fast you're catching walleyes, and it can be thought of as something of an index of the quality of the fishery. But it's very much attuned to the availability or the abundance of fish. So if they have been coming down some, then we would expect this to decline as it appears to have in, in 2020. Now, this is the amount of effort uh, expressed in angler hours. So this is not catch. This is how many hours collectively uh, fishermen are exerting on the bay. And again, it's broken out between open water, winter, and charter. And we can see that this has been the lowest level in 2020 that we have measured since we've had krill surveys taking place since 1986. Um, curious that effort would be so low when we're enjoying such good walleye fishing. But we believe that this is probably tied heavily to the availability of yellow perch, which are still largely depressed in Saginaw Bay in terms of their overall numbers. So that may account for why this is so low. But this is also a phenomenon that we see playing out across the state and really around the country. That outdoor recreation in terms of fishing and hunting um, generally has been getting less and less participation. So this is not necessarily unique to Saginaw Bay. 
This is an estimate of all the walleyes out there in Saginaw Bay, age two and older. This is another product of our um, statistical catch at age model. This is, again, based on fishing years. So uh, this is up through um, the 2019 uh, year, which would reflect data through March of 2020. So this is about a year old. It, it will be updated very soon, and we I'm largely expecting that it will come down some, but you can see that we're at almost record abundance. The dashed line on either side of this bar is uh, simply um, the confidence interval, if you will, uh, about the, our estimate, uh, which is the black line in the middle. And we had uh, almost 2 million new recruits in uh, the 2019 fishing year. Now, this is the same information I just showed you, the, the blue line, age two and older, but I broke out just age four and older, and that's the line underneath it. And the difference between the two lines are ages two and three-year-old walleye. So we have a lot of young walleye in Saginaw Bay. This is a reflection of all the strong recruitment that we have experienced. And with the liberalized harvest regulations since 2015, We've been looking to dampen and flatten that curve some. It's not very evident looking at age two and up, but when you look at age four and older, it does appear that that was uh, somewhat flattened out. Although by the 2019 fishing year, uh, it did increase. And that's simply uh, all these young walleyes, the ages of twos and threes, beginning to accumulate. This is a measure of where we are in terms of sustainability of uh, recreational fishery. This is a percent of unfished spawning stock biomass. So this is really just biomass of females, if you will. Um, and we're relating it to uh, what proportion we are if we had no fishing effort whatsoever. We can estimate what that is and then just calculate that proportion. And we always want to be above, above that horizontal red line there. And we can see that in our last estimate of 2019, that it went way up. And that's those recent strong year classes becoming sexually mature. So those females that are recruiting to the population really drove that up. So we're well north of that line, meaning that at least in terms of this index of sustainability, we're in good shape. This is uh, an examination of the total mortality rate. And you can think of this as the percentage of walleyes being removed from the population by all forms, not just harvest, but natural mortality sources also. And we have really two measures here. We have that based on our annual jaw tagging, that's the red line, and then also estimated by our catch and age model, that's the blue line. And these error bars up and down just show us the confidence interval with it. We believe the true value to be somewhere in that range. Um, the, we don't have uh, the uh, estimate from the catch at age model uh, for the most recent years. That, only, that always runs a year behind, but we can see how the two uh, estimates, these are independent estimates of the same thing, compare. And the important thing is that it says that total annual mortality is somewhere just a little less than 50% down to maybe about 32%. Either one of those are sustainable for a healthy walleye population. So this is another measure of sustainability, and it suggests that at the moment we're okay. Now, this is exploitation rate, again, measured two different ways. Uh, the top one is from our jaw tagging uh, uh, tag returns, and the, the bottom value is from our uh, catch at age uh, model. And while the the two estimates differ slightly. Um, they are actually pretty similar, and it suggests to us that the, the true exploitation rate, which again is a, like the proportion of walleyes being harvested from the population, is probably less than 13%. So that's entirely sustainable for a walleye population. This is shifting now to yellow perch. And back to the trawling information, this is the catch rate uh, of young and older yellow perch in 10-minute tows. So the, the yellow bar is the age zero, or the young of years, we sometimes call it. And the purple bar is age one and older yellow perch. 
And so for a long time there through the 70s and 80s and early 90s, we had both, as you would expect, because it's, after all, it's the, the purple part of the bar that anglers and commercial fishers are interested in. Uh, but you got to have some of those yellow bars to represent the younger fish coming up. And we had a lull in both in the 90s. That was about the time that dracenid mussels, like zebra mussels, were colonizing. Uh, but just like with walleye, when uh, alewives disappeared from the system, the reproductive success of yellow perch exploded. And it has been very high ever since. So that's good. We're getting lots and lots of yellow perch reproduction. But we're not seeing very much in terms of those uh, yearling and older perch, the purple part of the bars, in recent years. That suggests to us that most of our young perch are dying somewhere between age zero and age one. Well, that's too early to be explained by either the recreational or the commercial fishery. This is natural mortality. So in a way now, the uh, uh, predator-prey dynamics of Saginaw Bay has shifted such that yellow perch have really become a forage fish. And the predation rates apparently are so high that it's preventing us from getting the recruitment we need to have a really quality fishing yellow perch population. Uh, so that's part of the motivation for having the liberalized harvest regulations around walleye in recent years was that if maybe the walleye numbers could come down, that survival of young perch could go up. Because we know that walleye feed heavily on these young yellow perch, but so do other predators. We see them in the, in the stomach contents of just about all the predators that we examine. So it's not only walleye, but walleye are probably the most abundant top predator out there in the bay. These are creel survey statistics now specific to yellow perch. And the, the bluish, or maybe that's a teal color there, that's the uh, catch per unit effort, the number of, of uh, yellow perch per hour on the right-hand y-axis. And the green is the actual numbers being harvested on the left y-axis. And we can see how that has been trending down for some time. Occasionally, the catch rate will improve but the overall harvest numbers are uh, at very low levels when you compare them to where it had been in the past. Now, again, this information is, a, is about a year old, and we are hearing reports of much improved yellow perch fishing this spring. Uh, so we're hopeful that if, in fact, walleye numbers have come down the way we suspect, that maybe we're seeing a response in the yellow perch uh, population and fishery. We can't tell just yet from this data, but these are the kinds of measurements that we're going to be looking for to see if there is, in fact, some improvement. This is the growth rate of yellow perch. Again, we're using age three as an indicator. You can see where they are relative to the state average. So they're growing very fast. Uh, and that's the silver lining to their low abundance is that we see some really nice big yellow perch out there. There just aren't enough of them. Really having a fast growth rate like this indicates a problem overall. Now we can see with the most recent information that growth rate has come down. And that's an early indication that maybe their numbers are coming back up. So again, we're going to be watching this closely, but this is more hopeful. So that's kind of a, uh, a quick synopsis of where we are with uh, walleye and uh, yellow perch. And after we're able to update our models um, later this spring or early summer, we'll have some new reads on where we are at. And we'll see if, in fact, that we are getting some improvements in the yellow perch population and fishery. That's what we're hoping for. And uh, we'll look forward to you know, reporting back to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for that fantastic update on our Saginaw Bay uh, perch and walleye fishery. Much appreciated. So next, we'll turn our attention to Cisco restoration in Lake Huron, which has been a long uh, talked about opportunity for our Lake Huron uh, fisheries uh, as an ecosystem restoration opportunity. And so next, I welcome uh, Kevin McDonald from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who is joining us this evening to share an update on those current restoration efforts ongoing in Lake Huron. So Kevin, welcome. Hello, my name is Kevin McDonald, I'm a, and I'm a fisheries biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based on the Alpena Conservation Office. 
Uh, today, I'm excited to be sharing some updates and some progress on an effort that our office has been a part of uh, to restore Cisco to the southern parts of Lake Huron. Uh, this project has been the result of a lot of work uh, from a lot of different agencies that have all been coordinating and working through the Lake Huron uh, Technical Committee. So before moving forward, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all the work that our hatchery programs and staff in the Alpena office have done along with all of our project partners. Uh, this truly is a collaborative effort and it just wouldn't be possible without the cooperation of each of the each agency or tribe that um, you can see here at the bottom of the screen. So to begin, I'd like to start with a brief history of Cisco and Lake Huron. Uh, as many folks probably know, prior to the mid 20th century, uh, Cisco were the most abundant, most abundant pelagic fish in Lake Huron. Uh, in fact, we can look back to a source dating back to 1929, said that Cisco would be found, quote, out of virtually every port in Lake Huron in the North Channel and Georgian Bay. Uh, so historically, uh, spawning aggregations were concentrated in just several hotspots, uh, including uh, Thunder Bay, uh, the northern portion of the lake, uh, stretching from the Lachino Islands all the way into the North uh, North Channel. Uh, the Bruce Peninsula, uh, both in the Georgian Bay and in the Maine Peninsula. And then lastly, Saginaw Bay, which is going to be the focus of the rest of this talk, is uh, the spawning aggregations that used to occur there. So between the 1940s and 1970s is when we really see the Cisco decline um, from being the most abundant pelagic fish in Lake Huron down to just being a minor component of the Lake Huron fish community. And there were several causes for this, uh, and a few listed here are just the introduction of alewife and rainbow smelt, um, overfishing, and then water quality issues and habitat loss. And so on this figure, I, I, I should show the lake wide, so this includes US and Canada, um, commercial landings going back to the early 1900s. And you can see right in the, in the 1940s when we see that sharp decline in, in landings. And uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that historically, the Saginaw Bay population provided uh, some of the largest landings for the commercial fishery. And so that's one reason why we've taken an interest in restoring uh, Cisco into Saginaw Bay. So. So that was historically. Currently, uh, you know, where are the fish? And currently they are uh, concentrated into the northern part of the main basin, uh, starting from the Lachino Islands all the way over to Drummond Island, uh, the North Channel, and Georgian Bay. So uh, currently there is no known population uh, uh, in the, the main basin or Saginaw Bay. So the lack of fish uh, in the main basin in Saginaw Bay, or I should say of Cisco, uh, is one of the reasons that um, the Lake Huron Technical uh, Committee developed these fish community objectives for Kogonans in, in Lake Huron. And so the first is, uh, the first objective that was identified was to maintain the present diversity of those fish. Uh, the second was to manage Lake Whitefish and Cisco's uh, at levels that are capable of sustaining annual harvests of 3.8 million kilograms. And the third one here, which uh, is important for the rest of the talk, is to restore Cisco to a significant level and, where, where possible, protect uh, the rare deep water Cisco's. And so uh, we decided to begin this reintroduction process uh, in Saginaw Bay uh, with hopes that uh, this reintroducing fish in Saginaw Bay, they would eventually spread to the main basin of, of Lake Huron. So, you know, why is it important to re recover uh, Cisco in Lake Huron? Uh, the first is, you know, Cisco's, as I documented, they historically were an important commercial fishery. Uh, and we, we think that, you know, they could provide a, an important component for commercial and recreational fisheries in the future. Uh, predatory fish in Lake Huron would definitely benefit uh, from additional prey source. Uh, especially a prey source that is low in uh, thiaminase, uh, which can have negative effects for, you know, uh, lake trout and uh, lake trout uh, ability to reproduce. Uh, they can hopefully provide a pelagic buffer for yellow perch populations. Uh, and uh, and really, they, they differ from other pelagic prey fish, and they occupy a different, a slightly different niche. And so, uh, and, and that niche is more in line with the historic uh, fish community. So, we're hoping that we're, we're able to reintroduce that or fill that niche once again. Uh, and Cisco, because of their spawning patterns um, coming in, in uh, coming into shore to, to spawn or coming in shallow to spawn, uh, they're able to connect nearshore and offshore food webs during during that process uh, pretty well. And uh, currently, 
uh, the the lower trophic levels in Lake Huron look a lot like uh, Superior, and we see Cisco thriving there. So we think the conditions are are right for a reintroduction, and that uh, really they have a good opportunity to be successful. So next, I'd like to just look at um, how the stocking and reintroduction study uh, is actually functioning. And so the goal that we came up with was to stock uh, a million fingerlings uh, annually for a minimum of 10 years. And so we we're actually splitting those uh, cohorts between a spring and fall releases to evaluate how season and body size might affect uh, the relative performance or you know, survival of these stocked fish. And so uh, we actually collected our brood stock uh, from the north, northern Lake Huron uh, populations of Cisco that do exist uh, in the Lachino Islands and on Drummond Island. And so we collected those fish and gametes from those fish and uh, actually reared them in the Jordan River National Fish Hatchery. And so uh, currently, we, we, this effort began in uh, 2017 uh, and uh, continued into last year. And so currently, we have four, uh, four lines of brood stock uh, at that facility that uh, we can use into the future to provide uh, stocked fish. Uh, and, but once those fish are, are, are reared and ready to go, they get then transferred from the Jordan River fish hatchery and then we're stocking them in the Lake Huron. And so all fish uh, that are being stocked, I should also mention that we'll have a uh, OTC mark, or uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a bit. But essentially this is a way for us to identify uh, hatchery fish um, uh, and, and this is a great way to, to mark fish that are just too small for traditional methods like pit tags or floy tags or even fin clips. Uh, we're talking about uh, some pretty small fish. So uh, stocking events, uh, as I mentioned, they, they occur uh, in the fall and spring. And we also did uh, divided our stocking into uh, nearshore and offshore events. So. Uh, we, we did some shore stocking, and then we also used our um, research vessel, the Baird, uh, to do offshore stocking uh, in Saginaw Bay. And so all the stocking happened there, uh, either from the shore near Tawas or, or just off uh, shore there as well. And so what does that look like? Uh, so to date, uh, we've done pretty good in terms of meeting our goals, our stocking goals. Um, so here uh, on the left side of the slide, you can see uh, the size of fish, the two different sizes of the fish that get stocked. And so on the, the, the smaller fish would be a spring spring release fish. And uh, the larger fish there in the, in the palms would be an example of a fall released fish. And so, and then on the graph, uh, you can just see uh, starting in 2018, uh, how many fish have been stocked each year. And so I should denote in 2020, you'll notice those asterisks above those bars. And that's just to uh, indicate that in those years, um, we only were able to do shore stocking due to restrictions with COVID. However, in 2021, uh, we are planning on stocking and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do both shore and continue on our offshore stocking to evaluate um, how, how those strategies affect uh, survival rates. So I mentioned uh, that we're using OTC or oxytetracycline, uh, and so this is a this is a great technique, as I mentioned, to put a mark on very small fish, um, and it's a it's a non-invasive way to to mark fish as well. And so th this chemical uh, leaves a fluorescent mark on hard structures in the fish, so actually in their bones and otoliths and uh, other other structures such as that. Uh, and what's great is it's in in introduced to the fish uh, through their feed, uh, just in the hatchery prior to release. And so the goal here is uh, if we recapture a fish, we're able to pull their vertebrae um, uh, from, from that fish and you put it under a fluorescent light and then uh, it, it absorbs that light and then it'll actually fluoresce on its own. And uh, it'll, it, we were able to um, mark fish both in the spring and fall. And so in the spring, those fish received a single uh, treatment of OTC and in fall fish, they receive two treatments of uh, OTC. And so when we get these structures and we fluoresce them, we're actually able to tell if it was a spring release fish or a fall release fish. And so that's how we're, we'll be able to evaluate um, how effective a spring release is versus a fall release, uh, assuming that we're able to get these fish back. And so on the bottom of the slide, you can see um, examples of what a single mark versus a double mark there uh, looks like. And hopefully you can kind of tease apart uh, the difference there with the fall, fall release, you can see kind of two halos on each um, on each um, vertebrae versus the spring release where you only see a single mark. 
So after fish get uh, put in the lake or stocked in the lake, uh, the next question then becomes, you know, how are they doing? Are they surviving? Are they growing? And are they reproducing? And so to evaluate uh, if stocked fish are producing wild fish uh, in, in the in the bay, uh, we have started in 2017, have begun larval surveys in Saginaw Bay. And so these surveys uh, involve dragging a, a larval net known as a Newston net behind a boat uh, and running transects uh, throughout the bay. And you can see on the, the map here, all, each one of those dots is a survey point. Um, the goal here is to document recruitment if it is indeed happening. And so the 2018 year class, which was the first stock year class, uh, is now of spawning age. And so this year might be the first year that we actually are able to document successful spawning in Saginaw Bay. Uh, so far, those surveys have just started uh, and are continuing now, and hopefully we'll have some results soon. So moving on to um, uh, juveniles, uh, we, we utilize two different surveys to look for juvenile fish, uh, that, and those include uh, beach seines and small boat bottom trawls. And so on the map here, you can see uh, the, the red dots actually represent uh, the locations that we're going to and able to successfully beach seine. And so the idea here is, you know, similarly, we're looking to document recruitment uh, in case our larval sampling isn't able to find fish. Hopefully this is just another way to capture uh, fish and understand if uh, they are growing uh, to, to this level. And so these these surveys typically happen um, into May and June. And then adult surveys, we have a lot of different uh, surveys that help us get a hold of uh, any adults that we encounter in Saginaw Bay. Uh, those include uh, midwater trawls, and those are done through a bunch of agencies, USGS, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Michigan DNR. Um, and as well as bottom trawl surveys uh, in the deeper parts of uh, Saginaw Bay by USGS. And then Michigan DNR also has a, a gill net survey that they do each year. And then as well as uh, looking at the stomach contents from their lake trout survey. So we're able, if we find that lake trout are in fact eating Cisco, uh, again, we'll be able to uh, know or hopefully find fish in uh, lake trout stomachs as well. And so the last survey that we do is a, is a fall uh, gill netting survey looking for spawning fish to document if stocked fish are indeed spawning. And so uh, this year will actually be the first year that we're able to do that, um, that survey, because uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is about the first year that we, we expect uh, fish to start spawning in mass. So uh, the, the goal here is to head back to where they were stocked and put some gill nets and see if we can find some spawning in fish. And if uh, hopefully we're able to document spawning uh, there and then as, as well as some other locations as well. And so hopefully I've conveyed, you know, we are looking uh, for almost every life stage of, of Cisco and Saginaw Bay to hopefully document, you know, both how well the hatchery fish are surviving and then, you know, are they actually contributing to, to the population through successful spawning and recruitment. So looking forward, uh, what, you know, what's next for this project? Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, we have four lines of broodstock at the Jordan River National Fish Hatchery. Um, uh, and so we don't need to do any more gamete collections uh, up at the Lachino Islands and Drummond Island uh, until 2023. And that's just to replenish the broodstocks um, and make sure that we're capturing the correct you know, genetic diversity and, uh, that, that's necessary. Uh, but that, that's great news because having those broodstocks available uh, is just a more reliable egg source than uh, having to go up to the um, or go capture you know gametes in the wild every year. So we're excited to have that. Uh, so you know today I kind of went over the project overview, and so the question becomes you know well how well are the fish doing? Well to date oh, we've only seen a handful of cisco um, that have been encountered in Saginaw Bay. I believe uh, the largest amount were uh, encountered by a, a bait uh, fisherman who who got some small silvery fish uh, in his catch and, and let us know. But uh, we're we're Anticipating uh, some some bigger catches here uh, coming up, especially as the fish grow and mature and uh, become more susceptible to especially our adult surveys. Uh, and yeah, and another another thing that we have in the works is a lot of telemetry studies. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to put acoustic uh, tags in fish and uh, be able to track them through the lake uh, and understand you know where they go, especially after stocking. Uh, and then as well as where did the adults go after the, you know, after stocking and when they grow. So uh, stay tuned. We'll have some more information with that uh, coming up. So lastly, uh, I'd like to ask for your help. Um, 
so some of you may have already seen our, our Cisco Wanted posters around um, boat launches throughout the state. So if you do uh, encounter a Cisco uh, during your work or recreation, uh, we ask that you remove that tail uh, and wrap it in tinfoil or put it in a black bag and then re return it to uh, either the DNR office in Bay City or uh, Alpena or the Alpena U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Office. Um, that would be a great help to us. You know, and that's more information. And uh, if you turn in a fish, you know, we can definitely keep you in the loop and let you know uh, what we find out. So with that, uh, hopefully I've left enough time to take some questions. Uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, my email is on the slide. Feel free to get in touch. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thanks. Well, thank you, Kevin, for that amazing update and overview of Cisco restoration in Lake Huron, a super exciting effort led by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, among the many other partners that you referenced. So now we'll turn our attention to another nearshore topic of interest uh, across Lake Huron, and that's uh, that of cormorant management. And uh, Tony Aderman from the USDA Wildlife Services has traditionally provided a cormorant management update uh, for Lake Huron, and he is unable to join us this evening, but has recorded a presentation uh, that we'd like to share, and we'll pass uh, any questions uh, to Randy Claremont or Dave Fielder from the Department of Natural Resources, who have also been involved in those update efforts. So without uh, further ado, I'll, I'll pass uh, the update over to Tony. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony Aderman with USDA Wildlife Services, and I'm here to provide you with the 2020 Wildlife Services Double Crested Cormorant update from our management activities in 2020. But first, I want to start off with just kind of giving everybody a little bit of a reminder of kind of who is what and um, what agencies are involved with this cormorant management. <clears throat> Excuse me. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is pretty much responsible for providing permits for migratory birds, which cormorants are. So Region 3 out of Minneapolis um, sets us up with the opportunity for permits in order to do cormorant management. With that, Michigan DNR has applied for a permit and was accepted and now will be a sub-permittee under the Michigan DNR in order to do our management activities like we have in the past. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was kind of familiar with the different agencies and who is involved and what their role is. That's kind of just a general overview. So getting started, Here's a map of the Lational Islands. Um, down in the bottom lower left corner, Green Island, which is just west of the Mackinac Bridge. St. Martin Shoal, um, Fossil Shoal is underwater and is lo no longer um, visible. Goose Island, Crow Island, and Little Saddlebag Island. Little Saddlebag Island has not had cormorants nesting on it and Several years, um, Crow Island still does, even though there's not much real estate left. Um, the cormorants do still nest there. They still nest on Goose Island. Um, Goose Island is kind of a long linear island, about probably 25 acres, very well treed. So there's mostly, primarily all tree nesters on Goose Island. St. Martin's is treeless and mostly ground nesters there. And Green Island is pretty much all treed with tree nesters there. Just want to show a graph from basically when we started. We actually started in 2004 um, with management activities in the Lachinos. And all, as you can see, all the little bitty colored lines there are Crow Island and Saddlebag Green Island, Green Island Shoal, St. Martin's, Winegrad, Goose Island. And as I just mentioned, the only ones that are still active are Goose Island, St. Martin's, and basically Green Island and Crow Island. Um, as you can see, we were able to bring the numbers down fairly quick early on, and we kind of got hung up around eight to 900 uh, which 2012 was a little bit of an odd year for whatever reason. I, I can't explain that. But our goal was to get it down to 500, and, and we really struggled, as you can see, going into 
um, 14 and 15. And then in 2016, the, the PRDO, which we, uh, the previous uh, order that we worked under to do management was vacated. And we were no longer able to do Cormorant management in 2016 and 17. Um, the numbers did creep back up a little bit. By 18, we were able to do management. Um, but we pretty much looked at it as like a 50% take. Um, we were able to achieve that, but that's what we had kind of done in the past. And as, as I mentioned, we weren't able to really bring those numbers down any. We would just kind of plateau um, around that 900, and we're starting to do it again in 19 um, and then in 2020. But in 2020, we made some changes that I'm about to show you. Um, but before I get to 2020, I just kind of want to show you what we did in 2019, just kind of as a reference. So island locations that I mentioned, um, nest oiled, birds removed. Um, essentially, if you look at the bottom uh, two lines there, the nest oiled were 695. Uh, the peak nest count was 1462, as you've just seen in the previous slide. And our take was... 11.45, which is about 39%. So we were a little bit under 50%. Um, in 2020, uh, a little bit of a change. Uh, the, the, the overall peak nest numbers were about the same as in 2019, but we did a kind of a, a different approach um, with the help of the Michigan DNR. It's called the consumptive index approach. And I'm not going to try to explain that because I can't knowledgeably do that. But uh, Randy Claremont with um, Michigan Fisheries, Michigan DNR Fisheries Division, or Dave Fielder could do a much better job of that. So that would be a much better question to talk to them. But with using this approach, you can see we almost took 60% in 2020. And that's what we planned to do back in 2016 before the PRDO was vacated, was to really increase the take. Um, Dave Fielder had, had an equation set up and we were going to do that, but it was vacated and we were never able to do it. So I'm showing this slide again. We were able to do it in 2020 and my prediction is going into 2021 here, our peak nest count is hopefully quite a bit lower um, than it was in the past four years. So we're going to see what what that what that'll look like going into 2021 um, with a 60% take. Um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But my prediction is that it will be lower. But there are several factors that you know can influence that. So in 2021, our plans for the Lachinoas are pretty much the same. We need to gather nest counts from all the locations, um, and that's a peak nest count number. So we know what to do as far as management and, and, and where to do it. Um, we'll oil all available nests, and I say available nests, as I mentioned earlier. Really the only available nests anymore are on St. Martin Shoal, um, Green Island, Goose Island, Possibly Crow Island, there may be some because that's fairly, that's pretty much treeless, but uh, Goose and, and Green Island are, are tree nesters and, and they're just not available. So our, our availability to oil nests, cormorant nests are, are pretty limited in the Lachinoles. Um, we'll consider, you know, consider, continue to call adults um, with shotguns and we will in 2021, use the consumptive index approach, again, that was developed by Michigan DNR. Um, one thing that's kind of changed um, for us also in the past several years is the lake levels and what it's kind of done with cormorants, how it's kind of shifted them around and, and moved them around and, and changed their habits. Um, I'm kind of curious to see what the lake levels are this year and, and, and what kind of effect that may or may not have on, on the cormorants and the lace mills. I'm gonna, I also add, that's, that's pretty much my update for Cedarville. It's pretty, 
it's pretty short. It's pretty quick. Um, that's that's pretty much all the information I have. But I, I also like to um, let everybody know kind of what else we're doing out there, or what we what we have been doing out there. So, in the in the rest of Michigan, um, Beta Knock, we've we've done some management work there in the past up couple years, as you'll see, Beaver Island a little bit. Um, obviously, I just mentioned the Lace Nose. We've never missed basically a year there except for 16 and 17 when we weren't able to because there was no depredation orders to work under. Uh, Thunder Bay, Saginaw Bay, and back over Lake Michigan and Muddy. Jumping back um, to 2019, um, we really only did management in Round Island and Big Bay to Knock. Um, Round Island's one of the bigger cormorant colonies there that we have access to work on. Um, as you can see, the nest numbers were 1481, and we took 50% that year, um, uh, 1481 adults. We all a few nests. Um, we did get a rough estimate nest count over in Whiskey Island and the Beavers, but we did not do any management. Um, just didn't allow for it to work out that year, so we did not do any management in the Beavers. In 2020, um, so Round Island, the nest count numbers, they jumped up a little bit for whatever reason, up to 1591, just, just right at 1600. But well, we use a consumptive index approach there as well as far as our management take. And we took right at 66%. So I'm really curious, what, along with the Lacia Nose, to see what happens with Round Island and Big Bay to Knock, um, using that a little bit more uh, aggressive approach as far as um, take. We did the same thing, as you can see, in Whiskey Island. Um, nest numbers were up just a little bit from our previous 2019 estimate. And we took about 65%, um, again, using the consumptive index approach. So kind of curious to see where those nest numbers are gonna come in at those two locations as well for 2021. Here's just kind of another little way to look at uh, nest numbers across the board from this actually includes Thunder Bay, Lacia Nose, um, Beaver Island, Bay to Knock. Um, <clears throat> the, the problem with this is, is early on in the 2006, 2008, by 2008, we were doing management at all these locations. So that's really kind of the true peak nest number for all the locations I just mentioned. But as time went on, we had less success with accurate nest counts and um, good available nest data. So a lot of this in 2018, 19, and even 2020 is um, a little bit skewed because we don't have really good nest data information, or we did not, or we were not able to acquire it. I want to change that in 2021 and, and moving forward so we can really see what's going on. But with that being said, I predict these numbers are not really too much higher um, than what's here, um, just based on what I've seen out there. But again, I don't have the actual nest count data to back it up. So moving forward kind of for the rest of the state, uh, for Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, in Basin Knock, um, we will try to get a pretty comprehensive nest count um, at all cormorant um, nest locations and continue with management where we can. Uh, same for beaver, um, nest counts at all the net uh, colonies, um, the cormorant colonies out there and conduct management where we can, mostly through um, calling adults with uh, shotguns with non-toxic shot. Lacia Nose continue the same, nest count and management. Thunder Bay, um, do a nest count, and I say management based on, on the nest count. Actually, the last couple of years, the nest count on Thunder Bay have been at management goal or below. 
so we have not done anything management wise there um, just curious to see what happens um, this year in 2021 a lot of that I believe had to do with not only our management over the years but then as of uh, the last couple of years the higher lake levels really uh, the cormorants lost a lot of real estate on their typical or historic uh, nesting areas out there. So that really changed things um, out there. Flooding pump storage, that's the man-made break wall. We'll do nest counts and management out there. Um, and possibly in the Charity Islands and CDF um, Island, we'll do, if nothing else, we'll do nest counts for this year. It's pretty much the end of the presentation. Uh, I apologize to everybody. I will not be here to take questions um, this Thursday night. But with that being said, um, Brandon will leave this slide up on for a little bit. My contact information is there, my email, my direct line at the office, and my cell phone number. Um, please call those with any questions that you may have. Um, I've also asked Dave Fielder and Randy Claremont um, if, if you do have questions, they, they may be able to answer them. They're quite familiar with the cormorant management um, and what's been going on for all these years. But if, if there's another question that they're not able to answer, please feel free to reach out to me at any one of those contacts below, and I will get back to you with an answer as soon as possible. Thank you and have a good evening. Well, thanks, Tony, for taking the time to uh, record and share that update related to cormorant management in Lake Huron. Uh, we much appreciate, thank you. And now as we uh, round out our evening, it's been an action-packed evening and I'm excited to turn our attention to uh, the management updates related to our nearshore fisheries of Lake Huron. And I'd like to introduce Randy Claremont, who's the Lake Huron Basin Coordinator, uh, as well as Jeff Jolly, who has uh, recorded and, and, and will share some updates specific to uh, Saginaw Bay Fisheries uh, Management. So we'll start by sharing the recorded updates from Jeff and then turn our attention back to Randy to round out our evening. Thank you. Hello and good evening. Today I'll briefly share with you a few DNR items for the Lake Huron Nearshore Update for the Sea Grant Workshop. I'm not able to attend tonight so I've recorded my update and my colleagues can help field any questions this might generate. Here's a quick snapshot showing our two units. So I'm Jeff Jolly, the unit supervisor for the Southern Lake Huron unit and Dave Borgeson is the unit manager for the Northern unit. Addie Dutton and Jason Gosto are the biologists for the Southern Unit, while Neil Godby and Tim Selinski are the biologists for the Northern Unit. I won't take up too much time, but I wanted to touch on three topics in this update. The Saginaw Bay Walleye and Yellow Perch Work Group, uh, Lake Surgeon Reintroductions, and the Tinnabawassee Dam Failures. Last fall, we formed a constituent-based work group to discuss a vision for the uh, fishery of Saginaw Bay and Basin. This work group was formed after discussions with the Lake Huron Citizens Fishery Advisor meeting revealed that an overall discussion of goals and objectives was long for the bay was long overdue. So our vision was as follows, to develop an angler-driven vision for the present and future Saginaw Basin, that is, bays and rivers, walleye and yellow perch recreational fishery to incorporate into Michigan DNR management processes and decisions. Our great partners at the Michigan Sea Grant, namely Megan Goss and Brandon Schrader, were the facilitators of this group, and we put together a roadmap of the process. Uh, we formed the work group uh, with a variety uh, of folks representing various recreational angling interests, uh, like walleye fishing or, or members of walleye clubs, also sort of uh, folks associated with charter industry or even uh, retail businesses, and also wanted to make sure we captured a diversity of folks in terms of geography up and down and around the bay representing various areas. We held four virtual meetings where we discussed items like valuing and visioning, goals and sustainability, and priorities and trade-offs. We developed a survey to be administered to a random sample uh, from the Michigan DNR Angler database. 
And we piloted the survey through the Citizens Fishery Advisory Group. And, and the purpose of this survey is to even capture more information about uh, uh, values and priorities for the Bay. And the survey will launch very shortly, uh, probably within a week. After we complete and process the survey, we, the DNR, will compile a report outlining the results of our work group process, as well as a new management plan for the Saginaw Bay and associated uh, connecting rivers. The plan will be vetted through various uh, constituent groups and reviewed internally. And we're really hoping we can come up with a high quality product and have good buy-in from our partners so we can periodically go back to the plan and check in on how we are doing in the Bay and that our goals and values still match those that we identified in the plan. Uh, the end result would be uh, completion of the plan um, in time to submit new potential regulation changes in order to go through the normal uh, DNR review and vetting process. Here are some of the highlights from the work group process th thus far. Some of the things that were identified as, as of high value, uh, one was a resilient fishery that can bounce back and withstand change. Uh, the folks on the work group very much appreciated the, sta the state of the fishery as it is right now, very high quality Saginaw Bay walleye fishery. Uh, folks really appreciated a diverse fish community and, and the fishing opportunities that may, that might bring, whether it's diversity of, of types of fish, uh, you, you know, beyond walleye and yellow perch, uh, especially in the outer bay, you get into some of the salmonids, as well as opportunities, different ways in which you may use the bay and rivers for fishing and, and different uh, techniques you might use. People place a high value on native species recovery and restoration, and also high value on habitat restoration and water quality. You know, uh, it was very easily understood and recognized that you can't have a high quality fish population if you don't have the habitat and water quality to go with it. A couple of other notes. Uh, in terms of risk, uh, there was caution about taking uh, risks related to the fishery and, and folks really preferred calculated decision making. I think this stems from the fact that there was a time and, and, and people remember it when the walleye uh, fishery and the, the fishery of the bay was not uh, in good shape. And now currently uh, the walleye population is doing great and, and people value that, think that's something to be careful with and something to be respected. Also some frustration uh, expressed, you know, especially with the yellow perch fishery. This used to be such a popular fishery and high quality. It's really declined over the years, largely due to a very abundant walleye population. We think the, the predation on those juvenile perch is really uh, suppressing that population. So there's frustration there, uh, but also, you know, recognition that it's a challenging management situation. So moving on to the Lake Sturgeon reintroduction program, that began four years ago and it was paused last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, meaning we didn't stock any fish last year. Prior to that, we were targeting to stock over a thousand Lake Sturgeon uh, in the Saginaw River system. And our intent is to continue that stocking this year. We've been getting angle reports the last several years of the sturgeon being incidentally caught in the lower Saginaw River and out in the uh, bay by ice fishers. And we're hoping that this is an indication that we have good survival of these stocked fish. Efforts are also underway to acquire funding for a telemetry study that would help us understand how well the fish are surviving and where they might go after stocking. And finally, I just wanted to touch briefly on the issue of the Titabawassee Dam failures, which happened last May after our Sea Grant workshops had concluded. And I'll just cover a few questions that we've commonly received. So I'm sure that most of you remember both the Sanford Dam, which impounded Sanford Reservoir, and Wixom uh, Reservoir, uh, which was impounded by Edenville Dam, both uh, uh, breached and failed uh, last May. Here's Edenville Dam on the Titabawassee. Here's Sanford Dam uh, on the Titabawassee. The Titabawassee flows down through Midland, uh, down here uh, by the National Wildlife Refuge, where it becomes the Saginaw River. Um, the communities, excuse me, the communities of Sanford and Midland immediately downstream suffered great damage. Further downstream, the Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge, where the Flint River, the Cass, uh, the Shiawassee, and the Titabawassee mostly meet, uh, 
that took the blunt of the flooding downriver, and it likely reduced and prevented further flooding damage to Saginaw and Bay City. So the wetland complex there at, the, at that confluence really displayed its value, which we call ecosystem, fun, ecosystem services, in buffering the negative effects of those floodwaters. Uh, you might be aware that the river just below Dow Dam is one of the most important walleye spawning areas for the Saginaw Bay walleye population. Our observations thus far are that the habitat there remains intact and in good shape, um, and walleye uh, spawning occurred there again this year. Uh, we were able to tag a thousand fish in about a week's time as part of our angler harvest monitoring program, uh, just like in previous years. We also think that the 2020 Young of the Year walleye should have been mostly out of the river by the time the flood occurred. The walleye spawned in March, so their progeny should have been hatched and mostly moved downriver and out of the bay. If anything, the flood might have goosed them out into the bay a bit quicker. Other notes, the Dow ponds were not compromised in the flooding. Everything stayed contained in the way uh, that system of ponds is engineered uh, to contain potential hazardous substances worked as designed. And then the larger impact of increased sedimentation are unknown. As I mentioned, the, the spawning habitat uh, below Dow Dam looked good and intact, and I think some preliminary observations out in the bay of Corian Reef uh, don't really show that that's being uh, sedimented in at this time either. Issues that are being monitoring uh, include ongoing active erosion up in the basin, and also the potential for sea lamprey to colonize and spawn in many new areas of the Titabawasi that were formerly blocked by the dams. A multi-agency work group has been formed to monitor this situation and understand the implications that increased sea lamprey production might have for the control program and also for the Bay and Lake Huron's fisheries. And with that, I'll conclude. Here's our contact information. Sending emails right now is probably a, a better way because we're all working from our home offices, but calling these numbers will eventually get you to us as well. Thanks for your attention. Bye-bye. All right, appreciating that uh, uh, update from Jeff, and I'm gonna turn uh, the mic back over to uh, Randy uh, Claremont as the Basin Coordinator. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brandon. And I guess given the amount of time we have left, which according to my clock is <laughs> we're at our time, um, I, I think Jeff covered the, covered the updates well. So I would just uh, open it up to questions. And I know one of the questions I wanted to uh, address, it was um, on cormorants and specifically talked about um, some of the Caspian terns and other avian species that can act as predators on fish and um, are, how are we treating those relative to, to cormorants. And you know, I think uh, a couple of things to point out, and, and one is, you know, this is where some of our non-lethal um, harassment techniques are effective for not only cormorants, but a variety of other species, especially at, at fish stocking sites where our, you know, the, the stocked fish are, are concentrated um, and it just creates a, a unique environment for the birds and the, and the fish to interact. So harassment techniques, and, and we've seen this with a lot of our stockings, oftentimes the, the, the gulls are the first to notice and show up and we'll try to get the fish before they start to move to deeper water. And that actually is a signal to the cormorants to, to move on in. So um, I think the strategy again is um, to use both non-lethal and lethal techniques when possible. Um, and with cormorant population, just given their numbers and the, 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 the idea behind this new permit system is it's, it's to alleviate conflicts. And the conflicts that I hear about from the management stand, standpoint are always fisheries and cormorants, and very seldom do I hear uh, any other bird species mentioned, um, and they're not covered under this permit system for lethal take. So good question. Um, and are there other, like I said, I'd rather look at some of the other questions, but I don't know if there's any other ones that are still open or do they all get answered online, Brandon? Yeah, there was a lot of great answers and just some appreciation for all of our <laughs> panelists and presenters for typing away. Um, I think uh, two that stood out uh, that I wanted to address live was one was regarding the trends of Atlantic salmon numbers in the fishery. Mm -hmm. And I saw there was a reference to last week's uh, presentation where that was addressed. So check out the recording. And then the other question, uh, there was several questions actually that related to your plans or thinking about uh, walleye size and creel, creel limits given Dave's presentation. 
Yeah, and so let me address both those with the Atlantic salmon. Yeah, the presentations online that really cover some of the trends and catch and effort in stocking. Um, I will say we've had a project funded uh, in support from the the Blue Water um, Anglers um, and uh, Michigan State University and MDNR to look at Atlantic salmon fishery uh, trends at a deeper level. So we ha actually have some preliminary stock assessment estimates. Uh, um, we stock about 100,000 Atlantic salmon every year, but how many survive each age class and cumulatively, how many do we have in Lake Huron? And Mad Zink, the graduate student there, has a preliminary estimate of about a half a million Atlantic salmon in Lake Huron at any point in time. So some some information coming out from Matt pretty soon in that project. Um, won't be covering the presentation, but we'll be sharing that as we get more detail down the road. The other question just about regulations, it's a great example to you know, come next week. Um, we are considering all kinds of regulations across Lake Huron. Um, these bays and nearshore areas, because of the decline in nutrients in the open water, have become huge drivers in the fishery, both in terms of fish recruitment, uh, catch effort, as you saw referenced uh, by Neil in the St. Mary's River, 30 to 35% of our total angler effort, similar uh, trends in Saginaw Bay. So, these bays and nearshore areas are so critical. And because we don't stock a lot of fish in them, a lot of them are the nearshore species, walleye and pike and bass, um, we really manage them through regulations. So those regulations become even more important. Um, we, we put a lot of science and monitoring and thinking behind it, but we also need feedback from anglers and stakeholders in terms of the effectiveness of the regulations from both the biological and social side. We'll get into that in more depth next week. We'll have a lot fewer uh, presentations, although the, great, the talks were great today, but we'll be able to actually field uh, more regulatory questions, both for walleye and perch in Saginaw Bay, but all of Lake Huron and inland waters included. Thanks, Randy, and appreciate the pitch uh, for next week. Again, it's been awesome to have three Thursdays in a row talking Lake Huron Fisheries. The only uh, questions I see remaining are not questions, but rather appreciation for all of our speakers and panelists uh, who contributed content this evening. Uh, so, Randy, I'm going to uh, thank you and your team and the rest of our presenters for all. Uh, and, been... and Michigan Sea Grant, you, Brandon, and your staff do a great job facilitating these. I'm not even sure how you do this magic behind the scenes, but you make <laughs> it seem very seamless. So we appreciate that. Well, thanks, Randy. And appreciation to everybody uh, hanging on as participants. Again, we would love and hope to in the future do these workshops out in our coastal communities in person. But given the times, uh, this virtual format is what we have, and we appreciate everybody showing up to have this conversation. Um, I'm going to round us out by saying this workshop uh, has been recorded, and uh, we'll be providing some post-workshop communications uh, that will provide the links to the recordings for this week, and, and as well as last week, and, and many of the resources that were shared in the chat. And uh, normally I would say safe travels uh, this evening and watch out for deer, but instead I'll say safe virtual travels and uh, we'll hope to see you all again uh, next year. Have a good evening. Thank you.